And I get off on the 79th Street exit on the one train on Broadway. And I walk out and there were no abandoned buildings. Mm. Cars were driving on the street. People were wearing suits. It was an incredible awakening for me. And as I grew older, I realized that what I was living in was not normal and that there was really an injustice being made to the people in my community because many of those young men, my friends that died, they were just as smart, they were just as talented. We just didn't have an opportunity. We didn't know where to go, what to do, where to get help. Um, and I vowed uh, very early on that I was gonna figure out ways of coming back to my community and creating some opportunities. It has been well established that companies with more ethnic, cultural, and gender diversity are more innovative and profitable than those without. Being intentional about diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy simply makes good business sense. But how do you do that? What strategies actually work? This podcast tells the stories of visionaries who are actually changing the diversity landscape of tech and explores the strategies they're using to become more diverse by design. This is Nia Darville, your host, and you're listening to the Diverse by Design podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Diverse by Design podcast. Today, I'm interviewing Perscolis' president and CEO, Plinio Ayala. Welcome, Plinio. Nia, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. So let's dive right in. Plinio, first tell us a little bit about your background. What's your story? What motivates you every day? Nia, I grew up on 178th Street and Southern Boulevard. Uh, I'm going to do a terrible job of this, but let me paint the picture of the neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, during my, my early years and through my teenage years, there was this huge migration out of the South Bronx. Um, entire pockets of our community picked up and left. They were going to other places in the city, to the suburbs. We didn't know where they were going, but folks that remained were people that couldn't afford to leave. We didn't know that then, but that was indeed the case. Um, on my block, by the summer of 1978, there were two buildings left. The building we were living in and across the street, there was this abandoned building. And behind that, there was a schoolyard. And during that summer, I must have been 14 years old. Me and my friends, either we were playing in the schoolyard when we could afford to buy a ball, which wasn't very often, or we'd play in that abandoned building. We couldn't go to the park because our moms uh, kept us from going to the park. It was full of glass and, and, and needles and syringes. And if you recall in the 70s in the Bronx and in New York City in general, it was um, in the middle of the heroin epidemic um, that was crippling the city. So, you know, we thought that our living situation was normal. That's, you know, what we saw. We went a couple of blocks left, a couple of blocks right, south, north. And typically there were abandoned buildings or buildings completely torn down, rubble all over, all over the place. And so that was our normal. Um, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And there were a lot of aha moments that I reflect upon now um, when I was young, but there were two in particular that I never really talk about that happened within months of that summer of 78 for me. So I mentioned that abandoned building. So when we couldn't go to the park or we couldn't go to the schoolyard because we didn't have a ball, we would play tag in that abandoned building. Um, and we would figure out a way of getting all the way to the roof and then coming back to the roof. And that was how we spent our summer. There was one day that summer when one of my friends on the way to the roof moved into one of the empty apartments. Now, just to describe the building, walls were ripped out, pieces of the floors were missing. And he decided to run into that apartment. We were chasing after him to, to tag him. And we saw this body of one of the young men in our block who had died with a needle in his arm. Wow. And it was a moment for us that um, as we left the building, we said to ourselves, there were two things that we were committing to ourselves. 
one that we'd never talk about that with anyone ever again. Um, and two, that we would vow that we would never, ever let ourselves um, fall into that predicament, into that situation. Mm. And unfortunately, um, you know, four of my friends ended up dying too early, either on drugs or, um, you know, in, in, to shootings, what, whatever the situation was, they passed away um, really early. But again, to me, that was what was normal, right? This is what I knew um, until that September. And that's when everything shifted for me. Um, I had not been on the subway ever until September of that year. My mom just wouldn't allow it. But I needed to get to, to school. And I got a scholarship uh, for a private school um, called Collegiate on 70. 7th Street and West End. And I get off on the 79th Street exit on the one train on Broadway. And I walk out and there were no abandoned buildings. Mm. Cars were driving on the street. People were wearing suits. It was an incredible awakening for me. And as I grew older, I realized that what I was living in was not normal. And that there was really an injustice being made to the people in my community because many of those young men, my friends that died, they were just as smart. They were just as talented. We just didn't have an opportunity. We didn't know where to go, what to do, where to get help. Um, and I vowed uh, very early on that I was going to figure out ways of coming back to my community and creating some opportunities um, in whichever way that was going to translate to it. Now, as you know, we've, we've done it through IT training, but um, I have spent my entire life trying to transform what was at that time really an injustice. Um, and that has allowed me to continue to move forward and continues to motivate me every day when I think about um, the conditions we were in when we were young kids. Um, and, you know, I've grown as an individual as a result of those experiences and really proud of the work that we do at Perscolas because in many ways we are creating opportunities for folks that without us may not have that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Very Splenio, thank you for sharing that story. Uh, it really gives us insight into why you do what you do. So tell us, how does your story inform your work at Priscolis? So you've served as the president and CEO of Priscolis for 18 years and have been with the nonprofit for more than 20. How have you seen Priscolis's work and commitment to diverse communities evolve over the years? Well, it's taken on a couple of shapes and sizes. The original intention of the organization was to deal with the issue of the digital divide and bridging that divide particularly in the South Bronx and then in other communities across New York City, with the recognition that the digital revolution was going to leave poor people behind, right? They didn't have access to $3,000 to buy a PC at the time. And so we decided to build this operation where we would refurbish computers and get them back out into the hands of people at cost. And at that time for us, it was like $150 and we were getting thousands of computers out. Um, to people in our community, in my community, right, brown and, 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 and black people. And while we were doing that, we had to begin training local residents to repair these computers. And typically within six months of being with Prescolis, they left us. And as we leaned into the why, it was because they now had a skill that translated to a lot more money in the industry. And so we began to recognize that... IT workforce development and training could be a real mechanism to create economic mobility for people of color. And that's exactly what we've done over the years is use um, our approach, which is really geared around um, input from employers to design these training tracks that allow us to train individuals in IT skills that are relevant and then be able to use that as a way to on-ramp our graduates into these good paying um, jobs. You know, Mia, I often talk about this, right? And um, 
I'm, I'm really not trying to be flip. I often say, you know, money doesn't solve all problems, but it sure helps, right? When you're making sure. 80, 90, hundred thousand dollars a year, if you get a flat tire, you fix it and you keep going. When you're making $10 an hour or $12 an hour and you get a flat tire, it could spiral things out of control. You can't fix the tire. You can't go to work. You lose your job. And so our objective at Prescolis is really in a very intentional way, getting people into career opportunities that eventually land them into good paying jobs, right? Good middle class jobs so that they can weather storms that without our training, they might not have been able to have done that. Wow. Leaning into that. So what you just described is uh, a workforce development agency, and there's so many workforce development agencies in existence. What makes Perscolis unique? Well, I think it's the recognition that we have three equally important sets of constituents, right? As an organization, it's our responsibility to create the best experience that we can for all of our learners, right? They're entrusting us to work with them to develop the skills they need to be able to enter the workforce. So everything that we do through our training program is really with that lens. But in addition to that, the training also affects our employers and they are just as an important um, group of constituents for us, right? Everything that we design is really with the recognition that we need their input to be able to train those learners and create this amazing diverse pipeline of talent that they eventually want to consume. And so we involve employers in every aspect of our uh, training creation because at the end of the day, if we're training people for the skills that they say they need, then they're likely to hire our graduates. And then, you know, the last set of constituents for us are investors, right? People that believe in the work that we're doing and they want to provide the grants, the funding to make sure that we can continue to provide services to the people we serve and grow those services to serve more people. We've got to ensure that we are using the funds wisely, efficiently, and can create the greatest return on that investment as possible. And that, I think, what's make this organization really different, right? It's the ability to do that well um, for all of our constituents. I've been doing this work for many, many years. There are very, very few organizations that have figured out uh, how to do that for all three. Mm. And we are one of them. Yes. I mean, one thing I've always said um, as someone who works at Perscolis is I appreciate how our nonprofit is run through a business lens. Right. So you're, you're looking at strategy. You're looking at making sure that all of your stakeholders are valued and catered to. And most nonprofits don't run like that. And I think that really contributes to Perscolis's success. So with your stories that you've told today, we can very clearly see how Perscolis provides value to the individuals who go through the programs. Tell me more about how it provides values to the organizations, the Fortune 500s, the startups that hire Perscolis graduates and partner with us in other ways. I think there's a, a real unique point in time in our history where corporations genuinely want to figure out a way of creating diversity within their workforce. Particularly for us, obviously being in IT, that's the one area where we want to have the most influence and impact. I think most corporations want to do good. They just don't know how to. They don't know how to go and identify this incredible talent in communities where they're not built to search for this talent um, and can rely on organizations like ours to identify the talent, train that talent, and make them available. Um, corporations play a key role in evening the playing field for people from communities that have been overlooked. Right? They should be able to put aside um, some of the barriers that have prevented people from acquiring these jobs. If you have the skill set and you have the ability to perform, then the color of your skin, your gender, your religious preference shouldn't matter, right? You should be uh, considered for that role 
alongside anyone else that may be qualified. And I think that's what we're trying to build here, a movement, uh, a recognition by employers to think differently about how they acquire talent, to look at the people that we are producing as viable candidates for their corporations. Um, I think that's how they play a big role in partnering with Prescolis. And I think the 650 companies that we've been working with um, since the inception of this organization think that way. Um, and as a result, we've been able to place, you know, 80% of all of our graduates into these good paying jobs because at the end of the day, we are providing something that they need. And, um, to your point earlier, um, running it as a business, Nia, the truth is that if the quality doesn't remain good, we'll go out of business as any company will. And so, um, over the years, we've ensured that the quality remains of the highest of possibilities because at the end of the day, we want to get more Americans, more people of color, more of our learners into these good paying jobs. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing, Plinio. That's amazing. So there have been some powerful partnerships that have driven Perscolis's growth over the last few years. Can you talk about some of those partnerships and the social impact of those collaborations? Yeah, I'll, I'll describe several because I think to the point I made earlier about the importance of our um, ensuring that we are equally valuing all of our constituents, right? Um, on the employer side, a company like Tech Systems, who has invested significantly in the development of talent at Perscolis and is a big consumption of the talent we produce, they truly believe um, in the importance of diversity and the value that it brings within their company. And through their funding and their partnership with the organization, we collectively with them have been able to expand very quickly in a number of geographies that probably would have taken us many more years to get to, um, including five in the middle of this pandemic. Um, and so, you know, companies like Tech Systems, um, who understand the value proposition of working with an organization like ours, is a true example of, you know, at the end of the day, sort of creating the ultimate win-win-win. You know, they are funding this program because it's creating this amazing diverse talent. So we're helping communities grow and develop and, and move forward. We're helping the economy get better because people are moving into these good paying jobs, paying taxes and supporting members of their community. And these corporations are winning because they've got this talent. Tech Systems recognizes the value of all of that. And that's why um, they've been a huge partner and sort of uh, an anchor reason why we've grown as quickly as we have over the last several years. You know, another example is um, members of the funding community and how they value the way we evaluate um, and collect data on our program. You know, it took me years for data to become part of the culture of this organization. In many organizations, I've seen data be used um, as a weapon, right? Um, uh, in many cases, very punitive. That's not how we look at data, right? We look at data to help us make corrections along the way, continue to improve our program so that our learners leave with the best skills they can. And as a result, we can report to our funders exactly how many people have been trained, what the outcomes have been, where the jobs have come from. And I think those investors, those funders find that incredibly appealing and appreciate our willingness to do that. And I think there's a growing uh, number of investors that have come to Prescolis as a result of that. Now, self-reporting data is not enough. I think that uh, a good organization is willing to have um, third parties come in and verify that data, validate the impact. And we've done that as well, right? Having gone through two random control trials and having independent bodies validate that people that go through our program do better um, than those that don't really create confidence in our investors and um you know, it's, it's been a pleasure working with a lot of large foundations that recognize the value that we bring and trust us with the resources to continue to provide the great quality work that we do for the people that we serve. 
Yeah, no, data is so important. Strategy is so important. And that just goes back to my earlier point about how just Perscolis underneath your leadership has become such a strategic body to achieve the great mission um, that we've been doing from the very beginning. So I'm going to pivot a little bit and ask you about Diverse by Design. So Perscolis launched Diverse by Design over five years ago. How does D by D help Perscolis accomplish its mission of advancing economic equity? You know, inclusion in this country for all members of every community doesn't just happen. There needs to be tremendous intentionality around creating inclusion for all Americans. And I think in order for us to be able to do that, we need to understand what are the root causes that creates this separation. I think getting to those root causes, you need to be brave and bold and have these very difficult conversations that allow us to conclude what are the right approaches to be able to solve these very systemic problems that this country faces. Diverse by design has allowed us to create a forum for companies to come and have those brave discussions to really understand what is precluding them from creating diversity in their tech workforce. And those conversations have led to some very meaningful pilots and projects that have expanded over the years. Now we've got a lot of work left to do, but the forum that we have created, I think has led to significant impact. Now I'd be incredibly arrogant to think that this groundswell of employers wanting to do good around the issue of diversity within their workforce was as a result of what we do. But I do want to think that we were a small part of that and we will continue to move the needle around diversity through these conversations, through these convenings, through the work that Diverse by Design does. It's our small way in creating a much more inclusive um, community uh, across this nation. You know, I, I want to spend a minute near if I can, because I don't think many people know this story, but, um, and I've said this often, so uh, I apologize if it's repetitive to you, but I think one of the qualities of a good leader is that person's ability to lay out a good and very strong vision, a clear vision for a company or organization, and then find really smart and talented people that can execute and try not to get in their way. And I remember uh, five, maybe now six years ago, Kenneth Walker, my colleague, and Damian Howard, my other colleague, coming into my office and presenting this concept of diverse by design. And I thought it was brilliant. We didn't know what it would translate into. We didn't know what it would evolve into, but they were brave enough to come into my office and, and think this through. The point I'm making here is that some of the greatest ideas that have transpired in this organization are not mine. They belong to others who have had the willingness and the bravery to bring them up and to challenge the status quo and to think very differently, innovatively about how we can create change in this country. And I am forever grateful to Damien and Ken for moving this initiative forward because I think it's had tremendous impact and will continue to have impact in years to come. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, Plenio, for being here on the podcast today. Thank you for your transformational leadership at Perscolis and the amazing impact that we are doing as an organization underneath your leadership. Do you have anything else to say to the people before we go? Nia, thank you. And thank you for being such an amazing colleague. And to those who are listening, uh, you know, this organization has been incredibly transformative, but we know we cannot do it alone. It really does take a village to make a huge change. And so if any of the listeners want to learn more about the organization, please visit our website um, or reach out to me um, at my email and I'd be happy to connect and figure out ways that you can get involved. I'll be sure to put the contact information for Plenio as well as our website right after this.
Thank you for tuning in to my conversation with Plinio Ayala, President and CEO of Perscolis. If you want to learn more about Perscolis, check out our website at www.perscolis.org. If you want to reach out to Plinio directly, you can send him an email at piala at perscolis.org or add him on LinkedIn. Diverse by Design is powered by Perscolis and the IT Senior Management Forum. To learn more about how we can help your organization become more diverse by design, visit our website at diversebydesign.org. Before we let you go, we want to thank our sponsors, Tech Systems, J.P. Morgan Chase, Google, Chubb, and Comcast NBC Universal for their support. If you like what you heard, make sure you subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss any insights about how you can make your organization diverse by design. Until next time.